I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm so excited because Christmas is here. Yes, Christmas is here, the best time of the year. Well, that's good, that's the rhyme. Christmas is here, the best time of the year, when all the boys and girls are glad. And no one has reason to be mad. Oh, that's very good, and it's so true. Yes, it is. Well, let's wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Yes, let's. All right. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, everyone. Now, please read me the funnies. Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. The marshal, Hoppy and his pals, have ridden to Pike's Landing to warn the citizens that the Indians are on the warpath. They trail Black John, who's been the ringleader of the troublemakers for so long, into town. The citizens get to work throwing up a barricade as the marshal rides up and down telling all new hands who come running up what the excitement's about. All party headed this way, armed to the teeth with smuggled rifles. Help throw up that barricade and man gun positions. Meanwhile, first picture next row, Hoppy, California, and Lucky are going down to the waterfront at the landing to Meeker's office to warn him to be on the lookout for Black John. As they near a pile of barrels, Hoppy suddenly makes a leap at him. Throws a gun on three thugs he's knocked over with the barrels. He says, Next time you attempt to ambush, you better cut out cigarettes, Moose. The smoke gives you away. And California snorts, hey, These mavericks may have been posted here to keep us from finding Black John. Hoppy tells him, You tie him up, California. I'll check on the freight office. And Hoppy walks over to Meeker's office and goes in, last picture, second row. He sees Meeker huddled before his safe. And he says, Working late, aren't you, Mr. Meeker? Meeker, who has been hurriedly stuffing things into the safe, stammers, Well, I, I, I heard about the coming attack, and I'm, well, I'm stowing away all valuable records to uh, protect the, the boat company. First picture, bottom row, Hoppy goes on. Yeah, and maybe you also heard of Black John. He's been working for Kirby's Bunch, helping to smuggle guns to Iron Claw's tribe. We chased Black John to this town. Well, I'm afraid there's no such person here. All right, I'll take your word for it. And Hoppy goes out. He tells Lucky in California, Hey, Black John's in there, all right. Hey, you mean you saw him? And last picture, Hoppy answers, No, I didn't have to. There's blood on the ladder leading to the upstairs storeroom. Oh, wasn't that smart of Hoppy to guess that Black John was in the storeroom? Yes, you bet it was. I that Mr. Meeker down and go up the steps after Black John. Well, Hoppy has his own reasons, so I'm afraid we'll have to be patient before he does that. Oh, next week, do you think we'll see the Indians attack Pike's Landing? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Now? Well, now, let's go over to the next page and read Prince Val, because you remember last week, Bolter, the pirate, uh, well, he escaped from, from King Aguar, and he's heard that the dames are going to attack Val's homeland. That's exactly right. I wonder whether Bolter is going to warn Prince Val about this. Well, let's find out. So turn over the page to page three, and here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hecate, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince, music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Far to the north, Boltar, who has fled from the anger of King Aguar, tackles a difficult problem. He alone knows of the coming invasion of Thule by the Danes. He realizes Val and King Aguar must be warned, but he's angry because he was thrown in a dungeon by King Aguar, and revenge and loyalty battle in his simple heart. But loyalty wins. A messenger is sent to warn the king of coming danger. 
Our last picture top row, Val with his father, organizes the fighting men. Come to man the great fleet of ships gathering in the fjord. And in no time at all, the ships are prepared and ready for war. King Aguar will command the center. Prince Val will lead the right wing. But who will captain the right wing? Always, Boltar had been the leader of the right wing. But Boltar is far to the north, where he has fled after his escape. What to do? And then Alita comes forward with a scheme. She suggests that little Prince Arn, the two-year-old baby boy, be appointed captain of the right wing in Boltar's place. Because, she says, where Arn goes, there goes Tillicum, who Boltar loves. And if Tillicum is there, Boltar is sure to come. First picture, bottom row, before the fleet sails... A consul is called, and the captains listen in surprise as King Agua gives the order of battle. I command the center. My son, Prince Valiant, the left wing. And then pointing to the little two-year-old boy wearing sword and shield, he says, And my grandson, Prince Arn, the right. <laughs> Last picture, a day later, Boltar hears the news and is full of bitterness. For his place, his battle station, has been given to a mere child. What an insult. Why is he insulted? Why, he, the roughest of all sea captains, finds out that Val and his father think his place can be taken by a little child. That's why he's angry. Oh, I see. But that was just a trick. They're hoping he'll get so mad that when he hears this, he'll come back to show them that they can't do without him. Oh, you mean he'll be so mad that he'll he'll fight so hard he'll win? Yes. Yes, and, and when he hears Telecom will be there, I'll bet you he'll come back, I'll bet you. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now... Well, now, couldn't we do Donald Duck? You know, we haven't done him for quite a while. Why, we certainly can do Donald Duck. So let's go over the page past page four. Turn over another page... Past Perry Mason and the Lone Ranger. Oh, here on page six is Donald Duck. So here we go with Donald Duck. And say the magic words with me. Squeed jump, squeed jump, squeed a chicka jack. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Daisy, Donald's girlfriend, is home in bed sick. The phone rings. She sits up and says, Hello? Oh, yes, yes. I feel awful. Flu or something. What? Oh, no, no, not today. What? In ten minutes? And the click on the other end of the line tells her that the party is hung up. A second later, Daisy's in the bathtub. A little later, first picture bottom row, she's at her dressing table painting her fingernails. A little later, she's powdering her nose. Putting on lipstick. Fixing her eyebrows. And then she's slipping into a very pretty nightgown. Squirting herself a perfume. And then slips back into bed again. Pulls the covers over her. And then she hears... Come in. The door opens, last picture. And in walks Donald with a bouquet of flowers. He stops beside her bed and looks at her. And when he sees Daisy looking fresh as a daisy, Donald exclaims, How do you do it? Sick, but still beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> if he knew how much trouble she went through to get beautiful, he'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you bet he'd be surprised. Yes, yeah, so all that, Daisy. Even though she's sick, she wasn't too sick to make herself pretty. <laughs> well, she should. After all, she's his girlfriend. And she's afraid she might lose him if he saw her unpretty. Well, uh, if he really loved her, I don't think she would. But do you think she should take a chance? Well, no. No, I don't think she should take a chance. No, neither do I. Now? Now, would you please read me another of my favorites? I know who you are. That's right, Uncle Remus. I certainly will, if you'll turn over to the last page of the first section. All right, here I am, on the last page of the first section. And there he is, Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity-hoppity, make, make it a, a habit, habit to give us music for old Bear Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, Br'er Fox is all the time thinking about Br'er Rabbit till something better comes along. 
Yes, and this day's no different. Br'er Rabbit peeks out his window and sees Br'er Fox hiding behind a tree. The Br'er Rabbit says, Well, Br'er Fox has been laying for me all morning. It's about time I was getting rid of him. So he opens the window and stands behind the safe where he keeps his valuables and says loud enough for Br'er Fox to hear. Now that I has put all my gold in one big ball, I expect I better take it down to the bank for safekeeping. Br'er Fox exclaims, Gold? Hmm. So he sticks his head up out of the bushes, looks through the window, and sees Br'er Rabbit open his safe, last picture, top row. He sees him take out a big gold ball. And then he sees Br'er Rabbit practically break his back trying to lift the gold ball because it's so heavy. And he hears Br'er Rabbit saying, Oh, I'll be glad when I get this gold to the bank. And Br'er Fox says to himself, Yeah, then you ain't gonna be glad. And he watches as Br'er Rabbit staggers to the door, down the steps, and down the path. First picture, bottom row, he sees Br'er Rabbit coming toward the tree where he's hiding, still carrying the gold ball. And he hears Br'er Rabbit say, hey, This gold ball is getting heavier by the minute. And then Br'er Fox pops out from behind the bushes and says, Well, I'll relieve you of that way right now. Let go of that gold ball. Br'er Rabbit tosses into the air. It, up, up it goes. Third picture, bottom row. Br'er Fox exclaims, Hey, hey, what, what's this? And Br'er Rabbit says, if the price of gold is going up. And as the gold ball sails through the air, Br'er Fox chases off after it. And Br'er Rabbit saunters down the road, last picture, saying, <laughs> I knew that gold balloon would come in handy someday. And Uncle Remus says, A greedy man is always too willing to settle for something better. Isn't that a good joke on Br'er Fox? <laughs> yes, Br'er Rabbit found a good way to get Br'er Fox away from the bushes so he could go off to town and enjoy himself. <laughs> yes, pretending that balloon was a heavy gold ball. <laughs> and then when he let it go, it sailed through the air and then Br'er Fox chased after it. <laughs> I'll bet you he'll be running for weeks. Well, he'll be running for quite a while anyway. <laughs> now... Oh, well, now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page of the second section. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Blondie and Dagwood. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Rhyme a food, I'm a fum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie tells Dagwood... Dagwood, you have to get rid of that mouse. It kept me awake again all last night. Dagwood throws down his newspaper, goes out into the other room, walks over to Daisy and her pups and snarls at him. Fine thing! Six big healthy dogs around here and you can't even catch one little bitty mouse. As tears of shame run out of the dog's eyes, <laughs> Dagwood roars, last picture top row. What we need around this house is a good old-fashioned cat! <laughs> Everybody starts looking for cats. Alexander reports first picture next row. Al been loaned me his cat for the night. Cookie reports. I found these two strays in the alley. Dagwood gets one from a neighbor. Oh, Esmeralda is a wonderful mouser, Dagwood. Last picture, second row. Three neighbor kids bring cats to the Bumstead house. Oh, Mr. Bumstead, we heard you want to borrow some cats. That night, first picture, third row. As Dagwood prepares for bed, he says to Blondie... Well, it's going to be a different story around here now. That mouse isn't going to keep us awake anymore. In the middle of the night, the dogs come down the stairs. They see the cats lounging around. The dogs are a very jealous go. And the cats who don't like their tone of voice go. And one of the dogs walks up to one of the cats and he says... Which means, I dare you to knock this flea off my shoulder. And the cat answers, and last picture, third row, the dogs go after the cats. The cats go after the dogs. And they all dash up the stairs, making a terrific racket. Into Dagwood and Blondie's room they go, across the bed and around the room. A little later, in the middle of the night, Dagwood with a coat and hat over his bathrobe and his arms full of cats walks down the street. He knocks at a door. When it's open, he hands one of the cats to a lady, saying, I'm returning your cat, Mrs. Ribney. Thank you. And she snorts, At two o'clock in the morning!
An hour later, Dagwood is back in bed again. He's just dropped off to sleep. When? Blondie sits up, shakes him, and says... Dagwood, I hear that mouse again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, oh, poor Dagwood. And after all that trouble getting those caps, the mouse is still there. Yes, poor Dagwood. He has a terrible time solving his problems. Yes, poor Dagwood. He has a terrible time solving his problems. Yes. Well, now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, yes, Roy Rogers. And I'm anxious to read that because Roy and his friend Dolphal Hawkins, who's always so sad, are on the train that was captured by the crooks. Yes, they uncoupled the engine, laid down a spur track, and then made off with the whole train while Roy and Dolphal, who were tied up, watched. Well, I wonder whether they hurt Roy and Dolphal. Well, let's uh, find out right now. So here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. A yip yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip (laughs) yo Doleful says, Ain't it awful, Roy? Two hombres steal a whole cattle train before our eyes and leave us snubbed off like jugheads. Roy replies, Well, don't give up yet, Doleful. The engineer got blown off the train. Looks like he might only be stunned. At that moment, the engineer slowly sits up, holds his aching head. Roy calls to him, Hey, over here! The engineer gets to his feet and recognizes Doleful and Roy as the guards on the train. In a moment, he's untied them. And in another moment, Roy and Doleful are on their horses, heading down the road, last picture top row, trying to catch up with the cattle thieves. They gallop along the tracks to find out where the siding leads to. Meanwhile, first picture bottom row, the cattle rustlers, led by Dude, have rolled the train to a point by the river's edge where they unload the cattle and drive them down to the river and onto the flatboat. And Dude shouts, Hurry up, men! Load those critters on the flatboat! I want no trace left of steers or cars after this last haul! Last picture, Roy and Doleful hear the bawling cattle. They take a shortcut through the shrubbery and come out at a point overlooking the landing where the cattle thieves are. They see the cattle loaded onto a flatboat. And at that moment, see the boxcars of the train being rolled back and pushed into the river. Roy exclaims, Well, there's your answer, Doleful. That's how the cattle and cars vanish into thin air. And Doleful exclaims, Jumping catfish! Neatest rustling trick I ever saw! Of stealing things so you won't see the elephant. Yes, no one will ever know what has happened. Because the cattle will go down the river on a boat and disappear, and the boxcars will disappear underneath the water. Yes, it's a good thing Roy came there, and he's smarter than they are, and I'll bet you he'll find a way to capture them. Well, he'll need to be smarter because there's a lot of rustlers there, and there's only Roy and Doleful Hawkins. I I wonder how he will do it. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now, let's go over the page. All right. Oh, look, there's Flash Gordon. Yes, and remember, Flash Gordon is on the planet Mars, where he's been captured by the Queen Menta. That Queen Menta is cruel, and she's mean, and she's bad, and I don't trust her. I wonder what she's going to do to Flash and Dale and that nice man, Link. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. rega rega doon doon sash Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Queen Menta has plans to capture the Earth. Her scientists have developed a new secret weapon called the Melt Ray. Today, Menta has decided to find out how effective it is. Last picture, top row, Menta has brought Flash, Dale, and the others to the great hall of the prison. There, a cage is open, and an armored animal called a horrofang is freed and stalks toward them. First picture, bottom row, as the snarling beast springs forward, a tactician throws a switch. There's a blinding flash, and the horrifying disappears before their eyes. Manta turns to Flash and Dale and tells them that they saw what the melt ray did to the vicious animal. She says now she wants to learn whether it's effective against earthlings, and promises them that if one of them volunteers for the test and survives, all will go free. Last picture, Link volunteers. Flash tells him quietly, No, Link, I'm in command. I'll make the test. Oh, Flash is foolish to let her 
better try that thing out on him. Because if it could kill that animal, which looks as if it had an iron hide, just think what it could do to Flash. I feel the same way about it. But maybe Flash has a scheme in mind whereby he hopes to outsmart the queen. I wish he wouldn't try it this way. I wish he'd try to find another way to try to fool her. Well, now, don't worry too much about it, because remember, Flash has gotten out of difficult spots before. And next week, maybe we'll find out he'll get out of this one, too. I can hardly wait. Well, let's help you wait by turning over to the very last page and... Dick's Adventure. Oh, yes, and this one I'm anxious to read because Dick is on his way to the wilderness with two men called Lewis and Clark and their two explorers. Yes, they're under orders of the President of the United States to make a trip to the Northwest in the early, early days of this country. Yes, and a foreigner last week who was a man from a different country tried to offer Dick some money to become a traitor, but Dick wouldn't do it. No siree. But they know now, though, that they have enemies who are going to cause them trouble on this expedition. Let's read now and find out what happened. All right, here we go with Dick's Adventures. And say the magic words with me. riggedy pack kazak kazik Let's have music for Adventurous Dick. It's the 4th of July, the year 1804. For two months now, Lewis and Clark's expedition has been working its way up the mighty Missouri River, which is in the middle of the United States. Being the 4th of July, the men want to celebrate by having a great banquet. So that night, after the boats anchored, Dick slips off into the woods by himself with his long rifle. An hour after dawn, he drops a deer. Now he has the main course for their meal. On his way back toward the river in the boat, he passes through a melon patch. As he stops to pick melons for dessert, last picture, second row, he's surrounded by Indians who spring out of the bushes, arrows and tomahawks in hand. However, a careful explanation from Dick soon convinces the Indians that he wishes to be friends. A little later, Lewis and Clark and their men are amazed to see Dick with his Indian friends come out of the forest loaded with victuals for a good feast. And last picture, the Indians and white men in the Missouri River wilderness celebrate the 4th of July with a hearty feast. Oh, I was scared for a minute when those Indians came out of the forest and pointed those arrows at Dick. So was I. Believe me, I'm glad he made friends with them. I hope he makes friends with everybody, but I'm still worried about those foreigners. So am I. Those diplomats that Dick met in Washington are up to no good. And I think we can look for trouble next week. Oh, I hope not too much. No, not too much. Now, look. Oh, yes. Here underneath Dick's adventures, here's Rusty Raleigh. And you remember last week we found out something about those two Englishmen that came to the Miles Farm. Yes, they were pretending to be wealthy men. But we learned that they were so poor that they had asked the boy Pete to give them a ride in his car. Yes, and now Rusty knows this. And maybe he'll tell Tex and Mr. Miles. And they'll find out that these fellows are not to be trusted. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Pete is going to take Rusty for a ride in his car. They go to the garage, last picture, top row, to get the car. But they find that Sir Percival's is parked in front of Pete's. Pete looks for the key so he can move Sir Percival's car so he can get his own. He turns to Rusty and says, Hey, look at this, Rusty. A receipt from a car renting service right here in town. It fell out of the glove compartment when I got the key. Rusty exclaims, Gee whiz, then this car doesn't belong to Sir Percival at all. Meanwhile, in Sir Percival's room, first picture bottom row, the man named Nobby is saying, Well, how about it, Puss? What's it going to be this time? One of your investment swindles? Hey, why not get him to cash a rubber check and scram? Sir Percival replies, Nonsense, Nobby. Miles is good for something big. I haven't made up my mind yet as to what it'll be. Besides, I'm enjoying my sojourn in these pleasant surroundings. <laughs> Later in the barn, Tex, Pete, Rusty, and the man named Nobby, pretending to be Sir Percival's chauffeur, 
are out at the barn. They see a car pull up. Rusty exclaims, Hey, hey, look, Tex, a man with a big valise. And she whiz, a sort of a cop is with him. Tex looks and replies, Hmm? Oh, well, 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 that man in uniform is Danby, one of the guards at the bank in town. Hey, hello there, Danby. Howdy, Tex. Hey, Danby, what are you doing here with a shooting iron on? The guard replies, Well, I got a valuable delivery to make to Mr. Miles, Tex. Something the bank was keeping in the vault. Is he at home? Why, uh, yeah, sure. In the house. Go right up ahead. Thanks, Tex. So the guard walks up to the house carrying the valise. Last picture, Rusty exclaims, Gee, Willikins, Tex, what could they have in that valise that they'd send an armed guard with? Tex replies, Well, you know Mr. Miles is chairman of the charity horse show, Rusty. I figure them fellas is carrying the awards. And one of them is a $5,000 gold cup. And as Nobby overhears this, a crafty gleam comes in his eye. Oh, oh, I know what that crafty gleam in his eye means, I'll bet you. He's going to go and tell Sir Percival about those valuable things, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they tried to steal them from out of the safe. You know something? I wouldn't say that you're wrong about that. Mm, I hope not. I, I hope that they don't get Rusty or Pete into trouble. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Gleagly Man, but I'll be waiting. For you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend Miss Honey next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.